Ms. Jeffrey, can we begin with you stating your full name for the record and then spelling your first and last name for the record? My name is Laura Jeffrey. It's spelled L-A-U-R-A-J-E-F-F-E-R-Y. And do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes, absolutely. Now, Ms. Jeffrey, my understanding is, is that you were quite a senior embalmer as far as embalmers in Canada go. I'm the best kept secret in embalming. <laughs> you have been uh, working as a funeral director, and that includes embalming, for 27 years now. Yes. Um, which I did the math. That would mean you started roughly in 1996. I'm an old lady. <laughs> I started practicing law in 1995. Well, so we, you're an older fellow, too. <laughs> we, we share a, a long career. And for the past five years, my understanding is you would average roughly about 170 uh, uh, yes. I, I guess, I don't know what you call it. I would embalm I, and care for 170 people that required embalming. I would care for uh, many more that maybe weren't embalming, but I would care for them as well. Right. Now, right, because if somebody's being cremated, then they don't go through no, an embalming No, that's not process. necessarily true. Okay. It doesn't matter if you're buried or cremated. It depends on what you're doing beforehand. Okay. Now... <clears throat> When COVID came along, yes. my understanding is, is you were uh, working at a place which cared for approximately 600 deceased yes. persons a year? Yes. And um, in a year and a half, so COVID hits, so we must, we're in, I guess, March of 2020, and a year and a half goes by. Yes. Um, and you're still with this organization that deals cares with roughly 600 deceased persons a year. Yes. How many deaths did you see attributed, Seven. not caused, but attributed to COVID? Seven. And were there other comorbidities involved? Of course, the yes. The oh. Routinely, the COVID cases that I would see would be people that had been suffering dementia for probably quite some time uh, and living in a nursing home facility. And that's fairly typical in the winter. We would see that with any virus or any cold maybe that was going around because those people are very vulnerable. Now, what did you observe about the death rate when COVID swept through this land? Uh, nothing. There's nothing to observe. Nothing okay. changed. So nothing changed? Oh, well, that's not true, actually. So lockdowns create a situation where suicides and drug overdoses escalated dramatically. Now, what about the first lockdown? The first lockdown wasn't as obvious. Um, there may have been the odd, unusual death, but, I mean, that also could have just been normal timing because the first lockdown was the pajama party, right? The second lockdown was the problem. So the second lockdown, the escalation of suicide deaths and drug overdoses was obvious. Okay, Young so, people, middle-aged so people. And as an embalmer, I mean, you're aware of cause of death when, you, when yes. you're treating somebody. I mean, I don't always look, but... I mean, sometimes you're very aware. You can't miss it. Okay. So, um, so the suicides and drug o overdoses, they're yes. obviously increasing in number in the second lockdown. Second lockdown, yeah. Now, my understanding is, is that you had a, a very unique uh, experience with a, a nine-week period with a specific type of death. Can you share with us slowly okay. um, yeah. what what you witnessed and um, just how unusual that was. Okay, so in nine weeks, so one a week for nine weeks, there was middle-aged women that were, you know, well settled in their lives mostly, um, who didn't want to stay on earth anymore. So they left by their choice and their hand. So um, they had children, they had spouses, they had homes but the second lockdown was too much for them, so they left, and we cared for them. And it was awful, to be honest. I, it, like each week one, one, each week one person would do that for no reason. They had children, so that was hard. So, so these are, are mothers with children. Yeah, and average you people, average people, yeah. I mean, it could have been me, right? Except I don't have kids. But in a general sense, yes. It, it was a middle-aged woman that had children raging. I found aged like maybe 10 to 20 
And then you're looking at that middle-aged woman, right? And she has a home and a husband and children. So that happened. Had you ever in your career seen a, a suicide death no. from that type of person before? No, 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 no. Women don't do that. So this, this just stuck out like a sore thumb. Mm-hmm. Everybody noticed. Now, um, my understanding is, is that you started seeing changes after the COVID-19 vaccines yes. were introduced. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Um, it started in January of 2021. And at first, I was seeing an anomaly in what we would call return. So you have to understand a little bit about embalming. Um, embalming, we have a vat, and then there's a, a, a hose, and the vat has a pump in it. And what we do is we use the human circulatory system that God gave us. So we go into that circulatory system. Generally, we start at the carotid, right? That's a major artery that goes not to your brain, to your brain but also to the top of your heart. And it pumps the fluid through. And then the return would be people's blood that's pumped back out through the venous system and we open that and let it release. And the concept is, is to put preservation in and take out what would not preserve a body long term so that we can present a person that is reasonable to them, their appearance that they should be, right? Um, so when I was seeing the return, I started to notice anomalies in what the return was. So that went on for about three, four months. And the return was um, uh, more viscous. And it's not like I hadn't seen that before, but you didn't see it consistently every single person, right? Now I'm seeing it every single person. Now you have to explain to us what more viscous is. Viscous, thicker, darker, um, sticky. Uh, and that return, uh, what we call, I call return, it's return blood, right? So that return blood was stickier, uh, thicker, darker. And then I started seeing... Um, that return blood would have a little, little tiny, tiny pieces of clot in it, and the clot would be like a current jelly clot, but it's tiny pieces, like pinhead sized. But it was almost like polka dot coming out, right? So polka dot pattern, sticky vixes, more vix, more thicker blood, darker, and then these little pieces of clot that kind of looked like a polka dot pattern sticking to the embalming table, and of course that goes down the drain, right? But it, it was just different. There was something different. I would call it maybe dirty blood if you want to make a sort of a basic example, right? So the blood was dirtier. And, it, and at first, I'm really conscientious, right? So I notice things, and I'm known for that. So at first, I was sort of like, this is weird, right? But you can't, like, I'm an embalmer. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor, right? I'm an embalmer. But I notice things. And a lot of people do, and a lot of people don't. But in retrospect, there's an awful lot of people in my profession that are also saying the same thing. So they won't tell you that in person. They certainly wouldn't go public like this. But that's what they're telling me. Did you see um, changes in um, <clears throat> persons that were were dying after the vaccines were oh, introduced? Yes. So um, it was kind of horrifying. Well, it is horrifying. So uh, there was an escalation of middle-aged people's deaths. Like just average Canadian came home from work, had dinner with the family, and died suddenly at home. So that, was, uh, that went on for maybe uh, a good month and a half. Um, and usually an evening call, so what we call a night call, okay, you would send a, a removal team out to people because they're going into someone's home, right? Um, so they would, they usually a, a night call or a night removal would be in the middle of the night. Like it might start at 1 o'clock in the morning. You might get one, you might not, right? And then there was a lengthy period of time, like many weeks, where these middle-aged people were dying kind of like right after dinner at their house, with their families present, and they weren't being investigated. They were coming to the funeral home, and, and I was looking at this, and I'm like, this should be investigated because it's an unusual death. It's an unexpected death. But no, no, it wasn't investigated. It was almost like they dialed it in and uh, brought the person into our care at, at the funeral home, right, and then uh, didn't, didn't worry about them. So uh, there's a couple of things there. So... You were telling us that, <coughs> excuse me, typically a call is around 1 a.m. In, 
or you know after one a.m. Uh, yeah, in the morning. That, like middle of the night is when you if you if you're going to have a night call happen for some reason it always seems to be that one o'clock in the morning kind of time frame. And prior to the vaccines, uh, roughly how many would calls would you guys have on a night? You could get one in an evening. You could get two. You could get none. And then for a while there, it was every night, one, two, even maybe three. Always completed before 11 o'clock at night. So my removal staff were loving that because they weren't getting called out of bed, right? Yeah, they thought that was marvelous. And I was saying, why can't you see the pattern? Like, so everything's a pattern, right? Like, we're not really all that different. None of us are. We think we are, but we're not. So when we die or when we breathe or when we're born, there's patterns. And as soon as you see an anomaly in a pattern, you should be going, why is there an anomaly? But nobody was asking, why is there an anomaly? And then I'm a funeral director, and it's not my job to ask, why is there an anomaly? But I was asking, right? Like, why is there an anomaly in my mind? And so I started asking um, my coworkers, like, what did you see? Where were you? What was it like? Right? Family there, after dinner, um, average people, average home. It was an anomaly, a big one, obvious one. But it was like everybody had blinders on, right? So I don't know why nobody noticed, but I noticed. I was rather concerned. Now, my understanding is, is early on you had an experience with a 47-year-old man that it seemed unusual. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, um, okay, so you have someone that's uh, so healthy. Like, you can't miss it. Like, healthy. Like, if that gentleman walked in the room right now, we would all turn our heads and say, my goodness, what a good-looking man, right? Healthy, strong, fit, tall like huge, healthy person, gone right away. Just And um, his family told us that now he was invest his, his, his death was investigated, and his family told us point blank he died from clots. That's what they were told. And had you ever uh, seen a person that age and that fitness that had died of blood clots? Had I ever seen that before? Yes. Heavens no. No, no, too healthy. No, no, not healthy people. Okay, so that's why that sticks out in your mind, is it was so unusual. It sticks out in a lot of people's minds, I'm sure. Now, did you start seeing any, um, basically, scarring or anything like that on shoulders? Yeah, so um, for a long time, uh, people were coming in with that, like, a little Band-Aid, right? And I'd kind of go, okay, Laura, it's, it's just a Band-Aid, like, ignore it, even though, like, it was just unusual deaths with a Band-Aid, right? Right? That's how I'm supposed to look at it, because I'm not a doctor, I'm a bomber. But the reality is, I'm looking at this, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, there's a little tiny Band-Aid on everybody's shoulder. So that tells me, I mean, Band-Aids, what, they last, what, two, three days, if you're lucky, right? So that tells me there is a problem. And what were the, the ages of these people coming oh, in? Oh, full range. Full, full range. range. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, at that point, actually to, to be kind of clear, uh, more clear, at that point, people were, I would say it was that retirement age at that point because I was seeing people that were like maybe 60-something older with the Band-Aid. Now, earlier you were telling us changes that you saw in the blood. Yes. Um, so yeah. you were seeing little clots. Mm -hmm. um, you were seeing color changes. Yes. Um, was there also um, something else happening that you were starting to observe? Yeah, and that's what everybody wants to hear about, right? So uh, first, the, you, like you said, the viscosity changed, which means the color is going to be deeper, right? There's a stickiness. Um, it's been termed dirty blood. There's uh, small microclots in the return. And the odd time, there was like um, a rainbow slick, right? Remember the 80s? They had those uh, rainbow slick dresses or oil slick dresses, I think they called them. You would see that on the odd occasion, which is really weird. And then, um, and nobody can put their finger on it. <laughs> That's the weird thing. So in the spring of 2021, so we're talking April, May, so 
four or five months after the rollouts of the, of the gene therapy, right? So you would, I, the first time I saw it, I thought it was a parasite. So we have something called drainage forceps. I use a pair, generally speaking, that are about this long and then have a handle port and you can squeeze them like tweezers, right? So curved tweezers, think of them that way. So I, I use that to pull anything out of the way on the venous side of the body, so where you're draining the, the return blood, okay? And all of a sudden, I, I was having trouble. I couldn't understand, right? And then I pulled it out, and I went, and I kind of, you know, you can turn the drainage force up, and you can see what's in it, right? And I'm sort of like this, and I see something that I thought was a tapeworm, which was weird, because tapeworms shouldn't be in a in a circulatory system, right? And then I'm seeing, like, I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm thinking, is this a parasite? Because the tapeworm's a parasite, that looked like a parasite. And it was at that point maybe, you know, like three, four inches long, right? That's a small one. But at that point, that was a huge one for me because I'd never seen this before. This was a whole new anomaly. So I, I, just, I just want to make sure. So, I mean, at that point, you had been uh, embalming for a quarter of a century, 25 yeah. years. yeah. With and a heavy you, focus on it, yeah. You had never seen anything like that in no. your, your career. <laughs> Absolutely not. So uh, blood clots are sort of in a few categories. There's current jelly blood clots. There's chicken fat blood clots. There's just sludging, which is thicker blood in general. And then there was this anomaly, which I thought was a parasite. But it's not. Um, in what percentage? So this starts in April, May of 2021. Yes. So once you saw your first one, just, how common was it? To it, see just happen it just kept happening. It was everybody. So there was that. And how, how much of this would you find? Over time, it got bigger. So when I first started seeing it, it would be small, right? And then when I started seeing it, near the end of my time frame there. Um, if you were to take a, a small side plate, like a bread plate, and put spaghetti on it and kind of heap it, that could happen, yeah. Yeah, and no. they were longer and longer. And then the integrated jelly clots at the end, of course, adds to the, um, it adds to the confusion. Like, if you, if you were thinking it was a parasite, right, the integrated jelly clots were always at the end. So, so can you explain what you're talking about when yes. you say integrated jelly? Part? Okay, so Just if so you think of a white, you think of a, have you ever seen those erasers that you push out and they're like a pen, but they're a circle, right? Like, like they're, they're round, cylind cylindrical. So you think of one of those, right? But then it maybe has a couple little tentacles of eraser coming out the end. And then there's a blood clot that is integrated into the end of those tentacles. It felt like it was a parasite that was feeding off a blood clot that it created in the body. So when you think of a parasite, you think because it feeds off of something, right? So then you see the jelly clots at the end of this parasite, parasite, right? You see those and you think, are they feeding off of us as humans, right? Out of our circulatory system. Because they always had the current jelly integrated at the ends. It's nope. something to see. Let's put it to you that way. It's horrific. I'm, I'm going to show some photos yep. now, um, just so that um, <clears throat> nobody has um, believes that you took these photos. These are photos you basically had a, an embalmer from elsewhere share yes. with you, so that for the purposes of this presentation, you would be able mm -hmm. to show us yep. what you're talking about. So, <clears throat> David, could you pull up this computer screen, please? Yeah, that's so, it. So can okay so. Am I correct that this is basically what you would you would be pulling out of bodies? I appreciate this isn't a, an embalming that you did, but this nope. is typical of what you would yes. see. Yeah, so that would be, uh, if you were thinking that I started seeing this anomaly in the spring of uh, 2021, then I would have been seeing that uh, closer to the end of the year because that's a fairly large amount. And you can see, like, it's unfortunate it's not stretched out, but you can see where the, the current jelly cots are the darker pieces that are integrated 
into the white fiber mass. That's what I call them. I call them white fiber masses because they are fibrous. They are stretchy kind of, and they're very, you can't break them easily. You need to cut them. The, um, the white fiber uh, branches, so it, it's like an exact duplicate or a cast of the inside of an, ar an arterial system. So, so just so I'm clear, yes. um, and it, it's clear for everyone else, where are these coming out of? Everywhere. No, no, but what part of the body? Everywhere. Are you... Everywhere. Everywhere. But I had to change how I embalm because of these. I have a routine now. Well, I did. I don't have it anymore. I don't have to do it anymore. But I had a routine, right? So I would go into the carotid artery where we always start embalming on an average case, right? I would go into the carotid artery and I would, I wouldn't even try to put the cannula in, which is what comes from the pump, right? The vat. There's a hose and there's a cannula. It's a little crooked piece. It goes into the carotid artery. I wouldn't even try to put it in. Why would I bother? It's plugged anyway. So I would open the carotid artery, artery like normal. I would take a small pair of forceps and go in and pull. And I would find what I call the fish. I named everything because that's, I guess, how I function. But yeah, I would pull what I call the fish. And the fish would be an exact cast of the inside of that person's artery. So it usually was approximately this long. And it sits here. So if we go in here, right, it would be half, half the fish would be towards the head and half the fish would be towards the heart. So then once you pulled the fish out, you could put the cannula in, you would start the embalming. And what I quit doing, quite often we like to back pressure the human circulatory system to allow more fluid to go into the body and go everywhere, like right to the toes, right to the fingers, right? So I would instead uh, not back pressure. I would open the venous system fairly quickly after starting injection and uh, start pulling return because I would get, see what that picture was, right? That's mm -hmm. what I would start to see fairly quickly into the embalming. And I would be looking for it because I knew it was coming. Right? So when you know something's coming, you have to change you have to change how you care for somebody and you have to change your your uh, approach and your perspective, right? So embalmings that normally would take a couple hours were now taking like three or four hours. Because there was and, a lot more work involved. And, and I just wanted to clarify, like when I mm -hmm. say where are these coming from, it's from the circulatory system. Yes. yes. So okay. So we're looking at this one. I'm just gonna pull up another one. Yeah, that, that's small compared to some of them. But you can see there that those have been washed off. So you're seeing what I call the white fiber mass because I didn't really have a name for it. And if you were to cut those, there's no hole in the middle. They're solid. So they're not, like a lot of people were thinking that they were the lining of the circulatory system. Somehow it was lining. No, 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 no. It's plugging. It's a, it's a, I mean, a technical term would be the clot, right? But I hesitate to use that because people assume it's a blood clot. This is not a blood clot. This is something else. This is something new. And I'm just going to go to the next photo. Yep. Right. Okay, so those are some skinnier ones because you can see that they were branchy and they were down into smaller parts of the circulatory system, so they're closer to the capillary beds. Um, and you can see that um, <laughs> the fellow that, that took these pictures and was, was doing the work, right, he has, been, um, he has been keeping samples. I didn't do that, but he has. So you can see that the color has changed a little bit in those ones because if you look, the fluid that they're in uh, may be a bit of a, like a, um, it's type, type of a momming fluid, but it's to maintain like you can keep them long term like samples, right? Right. So I think that's maybe what he was doing there. But if you look, like if, if you look closely, you'll see that the ends of those fiber masses are quite small, very tiny, tiny. And that's because the branch is going into very tiny vessels in the human body. So they're they're really small. They're everywhere. Now um <clears throat> 
before COVID, I, I expect that there would be a certain number of, of um, autopsies done. Yes. And after COVID, that uh, I'm asking <laughs> if there was a change yeah. in the number of autopsies, and can you please tell us about that? So the concept was autopsies are too dangerous because there's a virus that's going to kill everybody, right? So we have to not worry about these things. Um, we'll do them if we absolutely have to, but they just didn't do them. So um, it set, I guess it would set the concept in people's minds not to do them, right? So, oh, well, it's pretty obvious why this person passed away. We'll just write that on the paper. So, so just so that I understand, because you're describing um, types of deaths that you hadn't seen before, such as, you know, middle-aged people just dying after supper mm -hmm. in front of their family, so at different hour. Right. Um, and so these are unusual deaths. And, and is it your evidence that there were not autopsies being done to explain this change in pattern? Yes. I felt that they were kind of dialed in, right? We'll just sign this piece of paper and dial it in. But again, it goes back to, it has nothing to do with each individual, right? It does. But, I mean, each individual is very important. But it has, there's a broader spectrum, right? It's like, if you see an anomaly in a pattern, whose job is it to call that out? Because it's not my job. It's someone that's got a much higher pay grade and much more power than I would. I'm just an embalmer. Why am I here? There should be other people here. But, but you do know if a body's been autopsied or not. So oh, very clearly, yes. Yep. <laughs> right. So you're right. able to tell us about... So actually, were there fewer autopsies done? Way there? less, yes. Well, and, but you have to put that in perspective too, right? So if I'm talking about a, a change in the pattern, and that change means that I'm seeing deaths that should have been investigated, and they're not being investigated, then really there would have been an escalation in autopsies, not a decrease. So I'm seeing a decrease from the norm, but then we're not in the normal zone because there's more deaths that should have been investigated. So now there should have been more autopsies than previous to COVID. That's the difference. Right. So basically, exactly, we were doing the exact opposite of, of what we should have been doing. Yes. Now, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you can also tell us, you saw a change concerning deaths of babies. Yes, I did. Can you tell us about that? Well, I was used to caring for maybe three to five babies in various stages of gestation. So like the whole pregnancy, I was used to seeing three to five, maybe a month, maybe two, but quite often three to five. Uh, and then that just stopped. There weren't any babies anymore. When did that stop? I would say February of 2021. It was winter time. Now, you, you did get one that caught your attention coming yes. in after the vaccination started. Can you yes. tell us about that? I don't think I can tell you about that. Okay. I'm sorry. So, that's, no, that's and that's over fair the line. Enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, but would it be fair to say that uh, it was something it, you had not seen anything like that before? No. No, I had not. Okay, so you're telling us basically you're having the normal course of events pre-vaccine three to five babies a month. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and then none. And then none. For how long were there nuns? Up until recently. Okay. So, so like we're, two years, almost. So yeah, so yeah, for two, two years. years, all of a sudden you're not, you're not receiving a single baby. Keeping in mind I worked in a very large community, right? And then I have a friend who works in a very large community, and he hasn't seen any babies until recently. But then you have to remember, I have a friend who works in a very small community, and he saw an escalation, a dramatic escalation. So it's like the small communities got a different memo than the big ones, how to care for babies during COVID. Right. Um, can you expand on that? I, I don't understand. Like, So there's been a change. Where do you... Where do you think so a social was? worker at the hospital would help a family that lost a baby. It wouldn't matter how old the baby, like how far in gestation the baby was. If someone went to the hospital and a woman was having a baby and the baby didn't live, right, then a social worker in larger hospitals, they have a social worker to assist that family. And the social worker would spend time with the family, time with the baby, give them pictures, give them footprints, and then ask them, would you like us as the hospital to care for the baby? 
Or would you like, do you have a funeral home that you would like to care for the baby? And then the social worker would liaison between the family and the funeral home so that we would care for the baby. And then that didn't happen anymore for almost two years. But then in a smaller town where they don't have a social worker that liaisons between the family and the funeral home, right? There was an escalation of small babies going through that funeral home for a period of time. I, I have a friend that uh, works in healthcare. Yes. Who has reported to me in Alberta that um, when an expecting mother's child has died in utero, that mm -hmm. rather than the hospital um, taking the child out, that they're being now sent to abortion clinics. Have you heard of anything similar happening in Ontario? I'm an embalmer, not an abortionist. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, my understanding is, is you also saw a change in your clientele that would speak perhaps to fatigue, and I'm wondering if you can share that. Okay, so I think I've told you that I'm well known for being very conscientious and very visual, right? Like I, I do a visual interpretation, and you can learn a lot from looking at a person's body. They can't talk anymore, but their body does. So fingernails, hands, scars, haircut, um, uh, sometimes clothing would give an indication of who a person was, right? And what I started to notice was over time, uh, people that I was caring for and embalming, because I can only speak to the ones that I embalmed, right? Um, but over time, you would see that fingernails that normally had been manicured were splayed, split, broken, and dirty, right? Toenails, same thing. The, the, the pedicure would still be there. Like the nail polish would still be there, but grown out probably about three months and not trimmed, right? You could see that the clothing was loose fitting, unkept, maybe had some foods built on it and not, not kept tidy. Uh, hair was growing out. You could see maybe they had highlights or something and they had not maintained those. And that was during a time frame that we were open for business, so to speak, in Ontario, right? Um, and this was con sort of a consistent thing, you would see that. I think people just got tired. Like when, when you're not feeling well, you get tired. So I was used to seeing, you know, unkept hair or personal care at a lower standard with people who were um, maybe suffering with cancer, a long-term illness, because they couldn't do it for themselves, right? And now I was seeing it for people that were at home, not ill, you know, no illness, right? Not an expected death. But you were just seeing that people were just unkept. They just weren't quite maybe what they should have been. Um, and then the last um, area I wanted to ask you about. Yes. Is um, do you have any thoughts on how we could have managed this situation better? But in relation to... Um, your area. I think an obvious one would be there should be more autopsies when there's a pattern change. But are there any other thoughts that you might have? Well, yeah. So on a professional and personal level, because, you know, I pay taxes too, like everybody else, right? Um, we rely on, uh, um, our system re relies on medical care and medical personnel, right? So if, if those personnel are restricted in what they can look at, what they can say, what they can surmise, what they can investigate, um, then our, we're not being cared for. Our community isn't being cared for. Our um, province isn't being cared for because you're taking the opportunity for people who are forward thinking to do their job, right? So when you take the opportunity for forward thinking people to do their job away and we're just like, monochromatic people, I guess. There's no intellectual thought process or investigation. If you take that away, then people die, right? Or did, did, it, did it happen because the people that should have been doing that job were afraid? Did it happen because they were, felt that they were duped as well? I don't know what was going on with coroners, but I would say that they should have noted, noted the anomaly, right? And maybe they did in their, inside themselves, but I haven't seen any reports where they're saying, oh dear, we have a problem, right? And then, you know, the pathologists, right? Where were they? Well, autopsies were less, but they weren't that much less. And if that's the case, then if the funeral director 
can see, right, then why weren't they seeing it? Because, I mean, I was seeing these fiber masses left, um, for lack of a better word, left dangling out of arteries that the pathology department had cut. That's their job. But I would have to take that out in order to embalm that person. And, you know, like they were wrong, right? <laughs> they were, it's horrific. It was absolutely horrific. I don't, I'm at the point where I don't think, I don't think I can do what I did for a year anymore because it has affected me. So I can do my work, but not at that level ever again, never. Because I, I don't need the aggravation that it causes me. It's not nice. Thank you. Now, those are my questions. Uh, we'll open it up if the commissioners have any questions for you. Yes. Oh. For your testimony. Uh, of course, I mean, the, uh, the structure you were seeing there, I mean, it's very difficult to know exactly what it is and how it came about. Um, I've seen video on that, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering myself what it could be. You're not aware of any people that would have tried to investigate? Oh, people have investigated it? it already. Yes, of course. And what is it that they typically found? Because when you mentioned parasite, for example, to me, yeah. it means that this is not human material. It's, it's foreign. I'm not a scientist. I can't investigate that. But I can send you in the right direction to look. Um, my profession, there's a few people that have been uh, quite dedicated to finding out, like, what is this, right? And, of course, that's the first thing that went through my mind, too. What is this? Because this is new. So if you're extremely curious, which you should be, then you maybe want to review uh, what Dr. Ryan Cole, who's a very dedicated pathologist in the U.S., has to say about that. But it's not for me to tell you what that is, because I don't know. I'm an embalmer. Right? So I, I won't tell you what he thinks it is. Look it up. My other question is about the timing of uh, having these people in terms of the COVID uh, unfolding and the vaccine rollout and so on. So have you seen a sort of coincidence of having more of these events when the vaccination rolled out was more intense, or is it t totally unrelated? They go hand in hand. It goes hand in hand. And mm -hmm. do you see now that the vaccine has been reduced? A lot of people are not no longer taking. Oh yeah, yeah. So have you seen a difference <laughs> in your in your daily work? Um, I can't actually speak to that because I don't embalm regularly anymore. So for the past, uh, I think we're at nine months now, I haven't been in that environment. So I can't tell you. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming today and sharing your testimony. Uh, Bernard asked a few of my questions, but uh, just, um, just to make sure I was listening correctly, these white fibrous masses, you mm -hmm. had never seen them no, before No, they don't exist before. Okay. 2021, spring of 2021. 2021 yeah. What's really weird is the embalmers that I have talked to, none of, none of us can nail down a date because we didn't log it, right? We just went, huh, that's weird, and then carried on. And then we started to go, huh, that's weird, like all the time. So none of us sort of logged it. I've had many talk to me, and they've said, hey, Laura, like, when did you start seeing that? And I said, the best I can tell you is spring of 2021. It and they say, yeah, me too, right? <laughs> so there, there's, um, within, within the profession, specifically in bombers, there's kind of like this curiosity of the timing of events, right? But when it comes to the timing of events, I've now spoken with Canadian directors across the country. I anticipate to be speaking to more, um, specifically those that embalm. But more and more are saying, and see, they won't say it in public. Like, I'm the only one that will stand up and say this in public, right? Which is terrifying, to be honest. So the, 
they're telling me that they saw exactly what I've discussed today, right? Like, okay, we started seeing middle-aged people that just died suddenly in, a, in a, that particular anomaly. We saw babies. Different, we, we had different stories about the babies, depending on the size of the community they lived in, but they saw that as well, right? Uh, yes, we saw these fiber mass, um, these fiber masses show up in the spring of 2021, but not every single embalmer will tell you that, and then there's funeral directors that don't embalm me too, right? They're not in the prep room every day. So that's, that put me in a, um, an unusual position, right, within the industry. And then there's also funeral directors that have very small funeral homes, and they do all parts of funeral service for a funeral. So those people would be more likely to express it, but they live in a smaller community. So they are more likely to see an escalation because not only do they live in that community, but they know those people and they love them, right? So they're, they take it more to heart as well. So they're more conscious. So it's kind of an interesting industry that way. Thank you. And so when you do an embalming, do you prepare a report or anything like that? Yeah. So um, an embalming report, I don't think is mandatory per se, but a lot of um, a lot of funeral directors do an embalming report. It's it's well suggested. Okay. <laughs> Raven authority might come at me now, <laughs> but anyway, um, yes, I I, re I prepared reports, um, and I I don't have access to those anymore. Right. Are so, the, what is the purpose of the report? Is it for? It's a long-term report. Home? So, if there was an issue where um, someone was disappointed in the effect that we created on their loved one, then the report could be looked at, and there would be like, uh, just an example: um, a woman had an unusual arm positioning. Well, that was her arm positioning, not what we did, right? So, I marked on the report. And then when there was a, hey, you know, we weren't really happy with how mom's arm was, well, we opened the report. There it is. There was an issue because of something that happened to her prior to our caring for her, right? So that's just an example. It's, it's very rare for me to ever go back and look at a report. Like, very rare. Never, pretty much. They just get filed. Okay. Yeah. And then just to change gears a little bit, uh, early in your testimony, you talked about an unusual nine-week period in which you saw a lot of middle-aged women who had ended their own lives. Yes, and it was I was awful. Just, I wasn't sure what nine-week period that was. Is there second anything? lockdown? Second lockdown. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I, I believe those are the the questions of the commissioners. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, the National Citizens Inquiry, thanks you so much for coming and attending and sharing this very important information with us. Okay. Can I, uh, can I just make a quick statement? Short, short. It's like short. Sure. Okay. So if you're a funeral director or an embalmer and you've been concerned about this for the last two years or so, um, if you would like to reach out, I've set up a Gmail account and you're welcome to reach out there. I, I don't know who would respond, but um, it's concernedfds at gmail.com. So it's C-O-N-C-E-R-N-E-D-F-D-S at gmail.com. And, you know, maybe we can talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jeffrey. <laughs>